time. Nice. In the daytime, this was this is Cloud Foundry in the light. We're uh, we're doing a little experiment. We've done the Cloud Foundry after dark, and that's a good time. But I wanted to start doing more one-on-one -on -one interviews with people in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem. So today, I'm joined by my friend who I just hung out with last week, Matt Curry. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Matt? Hey, yeah. So uh, my name is Matt Curry. I work at Allstate. Um, director of platform engineering, and we're uh, we're heavily invested in the Cloud Foundry journey and um, engaged with with Pivotal on that, and uh, using them to kind of and using that platform as um, somewhat of a trampoline to get some some momentum behind an organizational transformation, where we're really trying to take our organization and and drive innovation and bring innovation up to the forefront of what we're doing as a part of Allstate technology. So just for a little framing, and you told me some of this story before, but for the rest of our, our listeners at home, where did you do before you, you came over to Allstate? Yeah, so before I was at Allstate, I spent about eight years at PayPal um, working in operations, uh, doing some architecture work and doing uh, some different types of things. I just, uh, I kind of moved around from place to place. You know, I did performance and capacity stint for a while, and then eventually moved into a role that was called an architecture role, but was really more of a IT mercenary role going out and solving challenging problems um, in different areas of, of the infrastructure related to either code push or automation or different types of uh, problems uh, operating at PayPal scale. IT mercenary. Yeah, that, I think that's the unofficial title. It would look good on a business card, though. So, so from, from PayPal, what, what got you over to Allstate? So I, Andy worked with me at PayPal for a little while, and he has kind of this cool way of working where, um, you know, he really enables the, the people that he trusts, um, and he's really good at driving cultural change and transformation. And so he kind of convinced me to come over and help him take an insurance company that was pretty entrenched in its ways and try and drive a cultural change and transformation. And that sounded like a really hard problem to me, and I'm, I'm interested in uh, solving hard problems, so I decided to come over knowing that uh, working hand-in-hand -hand with him that, you know, we'd get the support we needed and that if we were going to be able to be successful at something like this, you know, this was a really good opportunity to, to take a swing at it. So for everyone out there in the, in the wild, this is Andy Zitney, who also just gave a, a talk at Cloud Foundry Summit about this you know, disruption and transformation. But it, was, it was explicitly to, to transform organization right that that was this it's not it's not implicit it's explicit yeah no it absolutely is explicit um, in everything we do and uh, the ability to go faster and compete and as Andy talked about at summit you know the feeling is that the insurance industry is ripe for disruption and so making sure that we're able to be out in front of that and innovate ourselves um, in such a way that that we're out in front of that is definitely a key part of the operating strategy going forward. So from the perspective of someone who's been inside of an organization uh, like PayPal, which I think you you kind of have to consider one of the, the cloud native companies, or, or at least web native, what, what are the differences you see from what you saw there uh, coming into an organization like Allstate? Um, well, I would say that, you know, the Silicon Valley community is the, is one part of it, which is, you know, people who are web oriented, um, who are used to kind of developing software as a solve for every problem, um, approach things slightly differently, or maybe drastically differently than folks who maybe are used to consuming pre-canned vendor solutions, or um, you know, are used to process and gating and governance to kind of protect them from risks um, and to use kind of, I mean, I think what I've seen is like there's a lot of these 
uh, interactions, like, hey, we just need a governance board to, like, sit in front of something and gate it, rather than actually, like, codifying uh, what that needs to be and how that problem needs to be solved. I would say that's one of the bigger the bigger cultural shifts I've seen, for sure. So there's um, a general observation, and, and maybe you can, you know, refute or reinforce how this applies to, to Allstate, but what I'm observing in, in a lot of these enterprises, as they as they realize that the the risk to their IT and the risk to their their core businesses kind of come from outside the building, right? the the risk of IT and and you know the the small kind of self inflicted problems that people can have if they don't manage change effectively are are relatively small right now compared to the the potential for the outside marauders, you know, the, the Silicon Valley barbarians to to disrupt your markets. Yeah, I think I think that's really interesting um, and a really interesting perspective. I would say the dynamics of that fear change based on level of the organization. So, like the guy who's sitting kind of closer to the server is really scared of somebody making an invalid change and him having to stay on a call night. And uh, you know, C level executives are much more scared of the Silicon Valley disruption. And so there's this like weird dynamic where that thing is a slider bar, that fear between those two things is maybe some kind of slider bar and, and it shifts as you move throughout the organization. And that creates this really weird disconnect and interesting dynamic between how those people interact and like what the end result uh, is from a cultural perspective. Fascinating. So in, in a sense it's like the, the vantage point from up on top of the hill where you can see the, the full battlefield is very different than the person that's uh, in the in the in the trench. Yeah. And how yeah. how how do you align? I mean, going back to and we've had some of these conversations uh, starting at the we we just met each other last week at the summit. But when you're talking about cultural transformation, how do you get that vision about what it what it takes to be competitive? Because ultimately, and, and you know, we see this, this cycle in a lot of uh, industries. The, the fact that you that you're able to work is a privilege right like we we're in a very uh, fast-paced you know well compensated industry right now but yep. there's there's no reason like this lasts forever so what what can you do inside of an organization to make sure that you by by providing for the health of that organization are always able to provide that for the organization um. So I think, you know, it's really about developing, I mean, I mean, this is why it comes back to culture and not technology, is because it's about developing the muscle, about developing the innovation muscle and, like, the ability for the organization to continually learn and continually improve. I think um, a lot of people kind of miss that in being really hyper-focused on, well, you know, GitHub uses this chat ops thing, or or Netflix uses Hystrix, and so that's this amazing thing, and we just need to go do that. Um, you know, they're continually creating those processes and finding ways to continuously improve and make themselves more efficient. And unless you can kind of build that in and start to get people to think that way, you're never going to be sustainably successful at what you're trying to drive. Um, and I actually think that's really the hardest part of this is to some degree we can we can use the tools to start getting people thinking about problems in a different way, but at the end of the day, the tools aren't the solve. It's not like you just drop them in and you're like, okay, we're good, I'm done. Um, it's really about you give people the tools as a way to say, hey, we're going to give you the best of free tools um, that other folks are using. You can interact and socialize with other folks who are doing these web type things and understand the tools that you're, they're using to solve problems um, as a way, as a mechanism almost for us to get you to start thinking about problems differently. So rather than thinking about, hey, I need to processize this or I need my new governance board or I need another ticket, um, really using the tools to facilitate the human element of IT operations and drive collaboration and innovation that way. But, um, but I guess, I mean, so, I, I agree with everything you said, but I guess yeah. the kind of a higher level thing, and maybe 
There's no, this is obviously not a solved problem. How do you connect that IT narrative? And certainly we can get better tools and certainly we can get better processes back to the, to the high level um, vision statement or, or you know, the, the view of the battlefield so that you can coordinate not just the fact that you have IT and you can move faster, but that you can deliver the right, the right solutions for your customers, the right solutions for your opportunities. Yeah, I, I've seen it done um, a few different ways, and one of the things I've really liked is kind of, it's one thing to paint like, hey, we're ripe for disruption, and, and it's important for people to understand that, but you also have to be able to paint a picture of, this is what we're building, and this is why it's going to be amazing for our customers, um, and this is how they're going to change everything, uh, how we're going to change everything to stay competitive and be out in front of the game. Um, I you mean, know, it's I, this might be over, it might be slightly the, oversimplifying, but I kind of frame everything in terms of love and fear. And you have right. to, it's a higher purpose to attach to this thing that we want to do because we, we love pursuing it, where you're kind of at a disadvantage, in my opinion, if everything's motivated by fear. And, and you know, like this, this scarcity uh, protective mindset of, Oh, someone out there could disrupt us versus, hey, here's, here's a bunch of things we can do to change our world, to make it better. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I think that's where you – so I think from traditional industry, we're starting at the fear spot, but where you want to get to is a very good point, the way you articulate it is where you don't even worry about what your competition is really doing and you're just really hyper-focused on delivering an experience for your customers. Um, because like one thing I've talked about a lot is when I first got to Allstate, a couple folks had asked me a question like, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to change? We're as good as our best competitor. Um, you know, why, why does this need to happen? And, and my answer generally is, well, we have this whole generation who lives on a mobile device. And when they're using the Allstate applications on their mobile device, they're not actually comparing us to another insurance company because they probably don't have one. They're comparing us to Facebook, Google, Twitter, whatever other applications are on their device. And like the level of engagement we're going to be able to drive with those customers is dictated by their perception of how great that experience is versus uh, the experiences they're used to from these disruptive web companies. And so at the end of the day, like I said, I think you have to be able to drive hyper customer focus um, where you're just saying I, I always want to be better for that individual for that customer um, and for us as well as well and agents are a huge part of our business we want to be better for the agents as well and give them an experience where they're just blown away by the efficiency and the ability to use um, you know the new uh, tools the next generation technology and that experience flows very seamlessly from what they're used to uh, interacting with those those web type companies and that it doesn't feel like they're stepping back 10 years to use uh, our products. Yeah, the language you're choosing just resonates with uh, something I deeply believe, which is that software is really all about creating experiences. And yeah. you know, all the things that you see with Netflix and Uber and the rest of this is, is really about that experience. and it's less about the fact that there's there's computers involved. That's just something that facilitates the experience. Right, right. So then we were just, you know, back to this kind of notion of Silicon Valley. We just were hanging out in Santa Clara at the Cloud Foundry Summit. And you have perspective and, and some DNA kind of from Silicon Valley ecosystem. So maybe we could talk a little bit about what we saw or what you saw at the Cloud Foundry Summit and then how Cloud Foundry kind of fits into your Worldview, you know, coming from a place like PayPal and whatever kind of platform you guys have built there. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I've actually been um, a Cloud Foundry fan for a little while, even before it was like an on-prem thing. Um, so when we were at PayPal, uh, we ended up a, kind of collaborating with the eBay guys. The eBay guys had created their own uh, platform as a service that was largely orchestration around OpenStack. Um, and here, coming into Allstate, uh, we purchased that from a vendor, 
but also, you know, it's an open solution. So that's fantastic because it's not like the typical vendor engagement where it's kind of a black box that sits at the core of our platform. Uh, we actually have the ability to collaborate with Pivotal directly. We have the ability to collaborate with the Cloud Foundry Foundation directly um, and influence product direction a little bit more than we might have with uh, typical vendor engagement, um, kind of your standard large-scale IT enterprise vendors. Because I already know a little bit of your story. I wore my uh, Cloud Foundry Loves OpenStack shirt for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like that. Those are, those are a Josh McKenzie special. Yeah, and the uh, coming out of OpenStack Summit la this last week, I think it's appropriate, right? That's right. We had back-to-back -back summits. Um, so, yeah, so, it, I mean, it's, it's different, um, but it, it, it's a good kind of different. I'm excited. I, I actually think that what you guys have at Pivotal, what you've built at Pivotal is pretty special. Um, I think, you know, the, the bench of people is the best of Silicon Valley, and so that is uh, almost as big of a sell as the product itself. Like, how, how many opportunities um, do you get as an enterprise to be able to really tap into the best and brightest um, coming out of the Bay Area and have them challenge you to think differently about technology and organization and empowering. So I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't pay you to say this, and I, don't, I didn't want to turn this into a pivotal commercial, but I'm actually excited, and I want to hear how you, you felt about just that whole ecosystem. You know, not, just, not just pivotal, not just Allstate, but I felt like there was actual excitement around kind of this movement to see, you know, there's, there's over 1,500 people registered for Cloud Foundry Summit. Right. Um, every everything I went to was basically standing room only, and I thought it was just it was amazing to. And I, I've been part of um, Puppet and I've been part of OpenStack, so it was just you know kind of another wave uh, of people just really thinking hard and, and getting excited about the possibilities of, of being able to do things in a different way. Yeah, I I think people were very excited. Um, we made a lot of good contacts with you know our peers in industry, um, folks that are that are contributing into the foundation um, and and playing a good part. And we had tons of good conversation about where this is going, um, the benefits, and uh, I thought it was really cool to see people thinking about you know this self service um, kind of platform where it's really focused on developers as a first-class citizen, um, you know, coming out of the traditional enterprise. I, I kind of think the di dichotomy of, like, that giant wall that sits between ops and dev is, like, taller in the enterprise than it is anywhere else. Um, even though that dynamic exists uh, in more of the web-based companies, I think that it exists to a much lesser degree. Um, and so, like, to just see that and not only see it, but see the excitement about it, both from, I mean, there were developers there, like, listening to Matt Stein's talk about, you know, how do you develop and deploy microservice architectures to, you know, mostly purely ops guys. Um, it was really cool to kind of see the conversation start to change in our industry around kind of bringing those things together. And I don't actually like to use the term DevOps, but I will say the empathy has changed. There's more empathy for the person that's sitting on the other side of the wall uh, than I've traditionally seen, and especially in that audience. And I think that's really cool and exciting from my perspective. So I think this actually, uh, you know, with your background at PayPal and then coming into something uh, like your uh, at Allstate, the the context of a web company, if you have that that high of a wall, you're going to go out of business. Right. Like, like you, you, it's an existential thing to bring that down to some reasonable uh, size of wall because it's no longer. I mean, one of the things that I feel observing, not just 
you know, insurance, where really large, large swaths of, of industry is that in enterprises where their core business had nothing to do with IT, and IT was this supporting, um, you know, quote unquote, cost center, a self fulfilling prophecy, that there wasn't any part of the value chain that really flowed through IT. And, and so you, you establish these processes and these mindsets and these identities and then ingrain them over time. And then now we're decades into this. And so that, that idea of someone who runs a server that keeps the mail going or, you know, and I always kind of half um, jokingly say they had to run the printers, but in many cases they, they did, then that's a very different thing than something like you see at a, at a Netflix or a Facebook or an Etsy or, or a PayPal where if those servers are down and those applications are not running, that's the whole business. Like there's no other value chain. There's no other, it doesn't, it's not just that you didn't get email for a couple hours. Like that's the whole thing. That's the whole point of existence. And so I think that alone is what drove some of the, you know, the word you didn't want to say, which is, which is the DevOps narrative. It's like you have to understand the application as an operator and as a developer, you have to understand the infrastructure or you're just not going to have a business at all. Right, right. And I, I think the other thing that's happened is, you know, as we've moved uh, further along the road with technology and this stuff is less new, that technology is now playing a much bigger part in that value chain than it ever has before, even in traditional business. And so, like, that may have driven some of this conversation just naturally. I mean, I think I saw something on Twitter fairly recently that um, Wall Street Journal was going to change the name of uh, one of their sections, like business and technology, right? Because it's, it's not just about business anymore, that technology is playing such a deep role in in that value chain and in, um, you know, the sustainability of business itself that... Uh, that it kind of has changed this conversation and dynamic. So this is a, a related thing that was said on the stage by, by James Waters when he was giving uh, his little fireside chat with Josh about what, what we really believe, and you know, this is kind of the, the diaspora of, or, or the, you know, the spreading of these web-centric mindsets, is that for the enterprises that are going to transition, and be long term and become these software driven enterprises that their their future looks looks suspiciously like places like Google and Facebook's past. And I'm just curious how, how you would see that or how you would frame uh, what you're going through with Allstate and also concerning your perspective of PayPal moving forward. Yeah. So I would I would agree, um, although I think it's it's different uh, a little bit in that, like we were talking about earlier, like even if we got to where those guys were today, um, it might not be enough if we haven't built in the ability to figure out what the next step is on our own, like that culture of continuous improvement. Um, you know, it's not like there is no destination. Um, it's just like the next point on the map is this. And we're just going to, we got to keep doing that and we have to create a way where we just continue to do that. And okay, the next place we need to go is here. The next place we need to go is here. The next place we need to go is here. And eventually, hopefully, you know, maybe, maybe it looks like how, how it looks today for those guys. Um, but maybe it looks different or slightly different because our business model is not the traditional technology business model, and we need to figure out a way to use that to our advantage, um, Absolutely. rather I, than rather than as a impediment. I I totally agree that you should not give up the the context and and the advantages you have in a space. But for me, and and I don't know what Alsi has planned, but I certainly looked at a. Uh, people's plans for doing, you know, their mobile strategy and their Internet of Things strategy and the rest of these, these types of things they want to do. And for many of them, when you start to do the math of what it's going to take to support uh, this kind of transaction rate at this scale, 
then the types of infrastructures they have to build just doing the back of the napkin calculation are going to be uh, vastly different from a, a scale perspective than anything they've ever had to deal with before. And if they're going to approach that with the, the kind of ITIL driven change management process that they that they've adopted, then they're they're in for a world of hurt. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be super cool to see a company like Allstate get to the point where, you know, they're writing their own file system because they're running at such massive scale. Um, you know, I. Uh, I hope we, we get there at some point and the uh, technology and engineering talent is like so ingrained in our DNA that that those are the types those are the things that become problems that are front of mind rather than you know more more core business problems or they become so highly aligned with core business problems because you know we're driving so much engagement traffic um, and business through technology. Um, but I do think that's one thing that's really different when you look at what happens in Silicon Valley. I mean, these guys are building generic technology solutions that in some cases get open sourced, like at Netflix, right? They built Histrix and they built all these things to like monitor and manage and maintain and grow and scale what their, um, you know, their architecture. Uh, but we are going to be able to ride on their coattails for a while, and that's really cool because we can go address the problems that are more core to our business model. I mean, that, that that's the beauty be of open source is the beauty of open source is you don't need to write a file system until that's the breaking point, right? Like right. if that's a if that's a differentiator for you, you're probably at a scale most people have never seen. Yeah, yeah, and that's that. I mean, I think that is the thing. A lot of people want to be the web company, but you don't necessarily have to be to be hugely successful. Like those problems may not be core to the, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to solve. But your point about the culture and the enablement and the way of thinking and, and the continuous improvement and always finding a better way, no matter what your competition is doing, is absolutely what people need to take away from looking at those firms. Um, that, that's a point I've been trying to drive into people for a few years now is that people look at a place like Amazon or Netflix and they, they really focus on the, on the tools and the, and the APIs and you know, the technical aspect of it. But you have Werner Vogels in public talking about their process and the, and the two pizza teams and their and they're, you know, the developers run the applications. And I, I don't see a lot of people rushing to, to replicate those patterns, uh, or at least as much as I, I think they would if, uh, if I was in charge of their, of their business. Yeah, I, always, I think that's really interesting is like, it, it's almost as if traditional firms don't really believe that that's the way they do it. Like it's a big lie. Right. You know, it's like, it's like, oh, look at all this cool stuff, but they don't really do things that way. Like, exactly. they must do something else. They, they must be lying to us. Yeah, yeah. It's this really weird, it's this really weird thing, and then you see some enterprises try and enable that journey, and they, like, pick the lowest hanging fruit they possibly could, or, you know, they just, like, don't invest enough belief that that transformation needs to happen and so it either like takes forever and slowly fizzles because of change in leadership or um, you know it just doesn't really get the momentum that it needs to get to drive the transformation at the level people want. Like there has to be this belief and you have to be so committed to it that like when the deadlines come and the fear sets in that you hang on even tighter rather than wanting to abandon ship and go back to what you know. Whatever your muscle memory is, whatever your twitch reflex is. Right. I, right. I think it's, it's hard to transform halfway. That's part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Well, so. I know you have work to do. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure. We could, I could sit and talk about a lot of this stuff all the time. Um, I think that the other thing I want to work on for uh, next time we hang out is 
we need you to eat the the sea urchin sushi. <laughs> All right, you got yourself a deal. So we'll, so we'll uh, we'll make sure we can get some of that uh, sushi action going again. All right, that sounds awesome, man. Do you have any other parting wisdom, and then we'll we'll call it a day? Um, no, just we're looking next forward to summit next year and telling our story. We think it's going to be uh, the best story to tell. And so then you're also one one more quick comment, and then and then we'll call it because I think this is related because I know you're hiring, and I'm certainly hiring. Uh, but it's it's especially interesting to watch uh, these enterprises and and when they complain about the the lack of um, the skills on the market. And then in, in reference to that, one of my favorite responses is from Adrian, who's at Netflix, who when, when someone kind of called him and said, called him out and said that you guys are special, you're Netflix, you have a, a lot of talent, you know, and you can do these things because your talent is so much better. And Adrian said, we hired them from you. Right. We, you look at most of our resumes, we hired, we hired most of our talent from the enterprise. Right. Yeah, it's it's true, man. I I mean, everything we said it goes back to culture and building that muscle memory, learning how to develop people, learning how to innovate, learning how to get people so they feel empowered. I mean, there's a lot of folks in the enterprise who have really fantastic ideas, and unfortunately, uh, the barriers to entry to see those ideas realized is just. Uh, too high and they don't really feel like they can take it any further and so they either got go try and do something on their own and sometimes that turns into like a successful startup that could have been organic within your firm and sometimes it doesn't go anywhere and a good idea was just wasted because you know your people don't really feel enabled to innovate and but, so uh, we want to turn that on our on its head for sure well, I know I met some of your your team, and I just want to impress on everyone, and you know, hopefully you agree that for most most of these enterprises, they already have the talent in their building. They just need to unlock it. They just need to reframe the way that they work more than go find a a magic unicorn to come help them. Yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. But some but sometimes it takes you got to hire a guy from PayPal to help you see that. <laughs> yes. Well. Uh, hire somebody that uh, you're going to empower to actually tell you things you don't want to hear and go do those things, um, you know, even if it's not what you want to hear. Because it's, uh, you know, definitely coming in, I mean, the tiniest thing, like getting whiteboards or ordering laptops for developers that aren't bogged down with all kinds of, like, crazy software that's unnecessary or whatever, uh, all of that contributes to the culture and uh, changing it is very difficult and it's, and it's widespread and it's a big challenge and you have to enable whoever that person is to go drive those conversations and have conversations with people about what we're really after and like how it affects the behaviors of the individuals that we're trying to empower. It's kind of like when you when you haven't worked out for a while and you decide you want to get in shape. That some of those some of those first workouts are a little less pleasant than you would I hope. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But it's the best thing for you. You just got to get through it. That's right. That's right. All right. Until next time, and we'll definitely do sushi again. I'm not sure when I'll see you in person, but. I'm sure I will, and I'm really excited. Obviously, you know, Cloud Foundry is a big thing that we're working on, and uh, I'm I'm glad we could be part of, of your journey. Yeah, man, me too. It's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. So I look forward to hanging out again, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Cheerio.